and let's continue with small steps. We were kind of left at a cliffhanger last time, so let's see what the other type of therapy she's going through looks like. It's called Chapter 6, Torture Time. Stop, I cried. It hurts. Part 2 consisted of special exercises. During the acute stage of polio, when the patient has a fever, frequent spasms to tighten the muscles, those muscles must be gradually stretched back to normal before they can regain strength. As I was moved out of isolation, I had my first physical therapy session. Immediately after my morning hot packs treatment, a physical therapist turned me onto my back. She grasped my right ankle with one hand and put her other hand on my right knee to keep my leg straight and raised my leg until it was straight up from my stomach. Because the big hamstring muscles in the backs of my legs were so tight, it was painful to hold my leg in that position, even after having hot packs. I begged the therapist to stop, but she held my leg firmly upright. I'm only trying to help you get well, she said. At last, she put my leg down and immediately grasped the other leg and stretched it. I couldn't kick or pull away. Mouth was my only defense, and I used it, shrieking and crying. Stop that, she snapped. You should be ashamed making such a scene. <clears throat> I stopped yelling, but I wasn't ashamed, and I couldn't control the tears that streamed down my cheeks. This is even worse than the hot packs, I complained when she finally put my leg down. At least the hot packs feel good part of the time. After they cool off, the stretching hurts all the time. Be grateful you're here at all, the therapist told me. After she left, I told Tommy her name was Mrs. Crab. From then on, that's what he called her. Mrs. Crab never had polio, I said. She doesn't know how much it hurts. That afternoon, Mrs. Crab came again. I groaned and said, it's torture time. Tommy giggled and repeated my comment to all of the nurses. From then on, my muscles were stretched twice a day. Another exercise that I hated was the one that stretched my hamstrings and my back at the same time. For this one, I was pushed up until I sat upright in bed with my legs out in front of me. The bottoms of my feet were placed flat against a board at the foot of the bed. Then Mrs. Crab put her hand on the back of my head, held my chin to my chest, and pulled my head down towards my knees. The pain began at the back of my neck and ran all the way down my spine and along the backs of both legs. Each time Miss Crab pushed, I thought I couldn't bear it. And then she pushed harder. No one ever explained the purpose of these stretching exercises to me. Mrs. Crab said, this will help you get well. But I didn't understand how, and I wasn't willing to take her word for it. All I knew was that twice, every day, my body was forced to move in ways that hurt. Each time Mrs. Crab pushed my head toward my knees, I groaned louder. The more I complained, the more she belittled me. You're acting like such a baby, she said, instead of a big girl, 12 years old. Look at little Tommy lying there in his iron lung. You don't hear him, him crying. Well, you're not stretching his hamstrings, I said. He looks pretty comfortable. You should be glad you're well enough to get therapy, she said. You should thank me instead of crying all the time. Thank you for torturing me, I said. She pushed my head down an extra inch. I was sure my spinal cord would snap in two if she leaned any harder. Perhaps Mrs. Crabb expected me to act more mature because I was tall for my age. At 12, I had already reached my full adult height of 5 feet 8 inches. But I had led a sheltered life in a small Midwestern town. Television wasn't common, and the only movies I'd ever seen were Bambi and Half of Snow White. My parents had to take me out of the middle of Snow White because I was so scared of the witch. Except for having my tonsils out, I had never been away from my parents overnight. Because my grandpa lived with us, I never even stayed with a babysitter. And now I was far away from home, in pain, and scared. Dad had to go back to work. And since visiting hours, Sundays only, were enforced after I was out of isolation, Mother went home with him. Austin was 100 miles from the hospital in Minneapolis. Mother and Dad planned to visit me each Sunday, but they were no longer my daily support system. I was on my own in dealing with Mrs. Crabb. By then, I knew that my chances of moving normally again were slim. I remembered the stories about polio epidemics that I'd heard before, they got, before I got sick. I looked back at pictures of polio patients in wheelchairs and leg braces. At least they could use their arms and hands. I couldn't even do that. When I asked the nurses questions about my future, their answers were vague. Things like, each case is different, or we can't know for sure what's going to happen. Although nobody came right out and said I would not get better, I sensed that the staff had seen many patients in my condition who remained paralyzed, and this terrified me. 
My parents and Dr. Beavis stayed optimistic, but I suspected they were only trying to keep me from panicking. Part of every day was taken up with routine care. Dr. Beavis checked me twice a day. Hot packs and stretching exercises lasted an hour and a half each morning, and again each afternoon. My sheets were changed daily, and the nurses took my temperature regularly. I was fed, turned, and bathed. Still, the days seemed endless. I had plenty of time to lie there and worry. I thought about my school, which was only a three-story building that had no ramps or elevators, only stairs. How could I finish school in a wheelchair? What would happen to me, I wondered. I loved animals and books. I wanted to be a vet or a writer, but either profession now seemed way beyond my reach. I thought about how our family vet lifted BJ onto the examining table for his checkups. It seemed unlikely that I would even be able to lift so much as a pet mouse. Writers must be able to hold a pencil or use a typewriter, and I couldn't do either. Even the ordinary hope of being a wife or a mother someday was dim. Who would want to marry a woman who couldn't go to the bathroom alone? My future seemed bleak, and yelling through torture time was the only way I vented my frustration. I knew when I screamed and cried that I was being difficult. I even realized that Mrs. Crabb would not be so hard on me if I cooperated, but I felt she was wrong to make light of my pain, and so I continued to carry on. One morning, Dr. Beavis came along while I was having my torture time. As usual, I shouted. I moaned while Mrs. Crabb told me what a crybaby I was. Dr. Beavis stood by my side by my bed for a moment watching. Suddenly embarrassed at my own behavior, I stopped yelling. I didn't want to see my hero, see me, at my worst. It hurts, doesn't it? He said. I nodded. If you do these exercises, he said, one of these days you'll walk for me. If you don't do them... He shrugged and let me figure out the consequences myself. I swallowed a scream as Mrs. Crabb forced my leg towards my knees. I'm proud of you for working so hard, Dr. Beavis said. <laughs> Sniffed Mrs. Crabb. That's all he said. That's all he needed to say. His words of acceptance and encouragement changed my behavior far more effectively than the therapist's constant scolding. With all my heart, I longed to keep my promise to walk for Dr. Beavis. I wanted to not only please him, I wanted it for myself. If I had to stretch my muscles in order to walk again, then I would stretch my muscles, no matter how much it hurt. But I still don't like Mrs. Crabb. And whenever I was sure Dr. Beavis was not nearby, I still yelled. That's the end of chapter six, torture time. So tell me what happened in this chapter. What sort of thoughts do you have in your head and what kind of feelings do you have in your heart?